Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 3. Before we begin, um, I know when anything is new or different, it can be hard to uh, adjust. You know, for those that are close to the front, looking to the side at that angle may be a little bit of a challenge. So, um, sorry if that is uncomfortable for any of you. Um, I know that we will acclimate, um, and also staring at the wall behind me. Um, I know that you'll eventually acclimate and you might actually pay attention to me again at some point in the near future. But I did want to acknowledge the, uh, the diligence of, of some men that, uh, that worked to, to make this come to pass. I, I don't want to mention all the names that were involved, um, or maybe I do. Doug uh, and his uh, fine workmanship with uh, Paul Dwyer as well. Uh, Their apprentice, uh, Andrew, was with them working as well, and previous to that, uh, others, Tony Bumpus involved with the wall and other things. Uh, A couple of families purchased the television, so that did not come out of church money. It wasn't, you know, the the Lord really provided for this project so that we could um, do this. So really thankful. I hope that it's an encouragement to you. I hope it'll be a blessing. Um, And ultimately, the the goal is not just to look nicer, but for us as, as an assembly, always to be pointing our, our focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you notice the, the, the woodwork is pointing at something. Did you notice that? Um, similarly to our logo that some of you don't really care much for, but I understand. But our logo has, has the, the concept of, of things revolving around the cross. Here we have things pointing to the cross. Uh, the goal for these types of things, though subtle, is, is really to emphasize the gospel. And so that is our goal now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. All right, James chapter 3, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have this morning to worship you. We have been privileged to worship you in our singing and our praying and our giving and our fellowship. And now we want to continue to worship you as we meditate upon your word. We pray that we would humbly submit ourselves to you, accomplish your will. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have you noticed how easy it is to be at conflict? All right, true or false question for you. Peace is hard, conflict is easy. True or false? I think that's true. I, two times in the last couple of days, I was driving down the street, and clearly everything is normal, just driving, and someone's at a, at a, a side, and they didn't like that I didn't stop to let them go. And so what they did, one person pulled out, that was pretty neat, two of them did one of those, you know, like a jab step, they lunged to let me know, hey, you should have let me go, pal. You think, this, this isn't normal. It's not normal behavior to say, I want to just let you know that you're annoying me, that I don't get to go before you. Conflict, it comes so naturally on the road. It comes naturally in the workplace. It comes naturally at home. There are seven of us living in a small house. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> think about the potential I look around and I see such potential. Potential for what? Potential for problems. There are seven people in a small area. You can guarantee someone's not in a good mood at one point during the day. So there's potential for conflict at home. And then you come into church and everyone puts on their Sunday best and they come in and and they, they wipe on their smile. But, you know, there are problems inside of people, right? Because... Just because we put on a suit or whatever and put on a smile doesn't mean that all of our cares have gone out the window. So we come with baggage, and sometimes when that happens, the interference of that baggage in each other's lives can produce conflict. It's it's normal. It's, It's all over the place. The world is filled with so many different kinds of personalities and perspectives. Do your children ever argue? No, 
not my children. When they argue, are they ever arguing over major issues? Are they solving the problems for world peace? Or finally dealing with that one theological dilemma that men have been fighting over forever, but your children have come to the final uh, solution. That's probably not what they're, they're fighting about. What are they usually arguing about? Well, that Lego is mine. <laughs> I have no words left. We have a million Legos. If you, want to, if you don't believe me, Sometimes say, hey, you said you have a million Legos. I want to see them. And probably if you counted them, there's probably not a million. But in theory, there's like this set and that set and this set and that set. And at one time, we had built all the, the, the airport and we built the police station and we built the fire station and we built the repair station and all these other stations that are all together. My wife and I spent like hours on end doing that with our kids to get it all set up. And then they end up in a bin and they're all pieces. They're not even together. It's like this stuff from the fire one and this one and stuff from, yeah. But there are lots and lots of Legos and people are fighting over that one. Seriously? Or his piece of cake is bigger than my piece of cake. Now it's delicious cake. It's moist and gooey and delicious. But it's cake. Like tomorrow? The cake will have only made you fat. That's it. You'll have a faint memory of enjoying it. And then you're thinking, oh, man, I probably shouldn't have had that much cake. But we fight over the size of the slice that we get. You ever argue with your spouse? Listen, I've had many counseling sessions in my office, and, and almost universally, everyone says, we don't fight about the big things. We fight about the little things. Find any resonate? You know, is that resonating within you? Little things, little things, little things. And after you fight about it, and you go away, and every you decompress, and you think about it, you think that was really stupid. What's wrong with me? You may also say, "What's wrong with her?" You shouldn't. You might, but. Ultimately, you also think, what's wrong with me? There's something's wrong. I, I, I made a big deal about something that really was not that big of an issue. Sometimes conflict isn't even ver verbal. Sometimes we just don't like what someone else does, and, and we keep it inside. Well, when it comes to God's church, there is a call to cast away conflict and unite together in love. And there is a reason for it. It's not just, well... I just want my people to get along. Like when I think about my family, I want my children to enjoy each other. I want them when they're 18 and 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 and 40, I want them to look back on life in our household with fondness. I want them to think, oh, my brother and sister, yeah, we fought a little bit, but we love each other and we, we, we were there for one another. We support one another. Mom and dad were always there no matter what. I could always tell them whatever. I want them to think back like this. So we have these great conceptions. There's even more when it comes to the church of God and the, the desire and the right desire for unity. Jesus told us in John chapter 13 after he washed the disciples' feet, he says, as I've washed your feet, do to one another. And he wasn't actually talking about taking out the basin and getting down on the floor and rubbing each other's nasty feet. Though if that were needed, then we should be willing to do it. Thankfully, we wear shoes that cover our toes, most of us. And as a result, we don't have to get out the base and rub each other's nasty feet. What was, the, what was the do this? It was to serve one another, to humble ourselves to one another, to love one another. He tells us in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just, just as I have loved you. you also are to love one another. How breathtaking is that statement? When you think of Jesus' love for you, what, what comes to your mind? What is the, the ultimate expression of Jesus' love for you? Jesus took on flesh. Jesus obeyed the law. 
Jesus was rejected. Jesus was crucified. And worse than that, far worse than any of that, Jesus became sin for us, was forsaken by the Father, had the judgment for my sin poured out on him so I would never face that judgment. This is the love of Jesus for his people, and this is the love that Jesus calls his people to have for one another. Just as I have loved you, you love one another. He goes on and says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Conflict amongst God's people undermines this very call. The call is to demonstrate to a world around us that we know Jesus. And if we know Jesus, His very love must mark our lives. Individually, and even more specifically to this context, corporately. Paul rebukes the Corinthian church regarding conflict in 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, he goes so far as to say, I can't even speak to you about important doctrinal issues because you are carnal, carnal, immature, fleshly. And what was at the heart of that carnality? There were divisions among the church. And so it kept them from being useful in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, you keep following me in your mind, keep following me. In Ephesians, chapter 3, Paul speaks even further to this, the importance of the unity of the church. And now in, in Ephesians 3, the context is Jew and Gentile. For us, as we consider its ramification, it's, it's whatever color of skin, whatever nationality we are, whatever gender we are, the unity that exists in the church has some effect. And that effect that he talks about in Ephesians chapter 3 is that there is an angelic realm that's looking in on the church to see how these, this motley crew of people functions together in unity. And what it does, as the church of God functions together in unity with all of our differences and differences of personality and backgrounds and every, all the baggage we bring to the table, as the angelic realm looks on that and sees God's unity in us, they are beholding the manifold wisdom of God. The unity of the church brings glory to God. The unity of the church reflects God's person his glory and his nature. And, and, and that, folks, is what we're here for. We're here to reflect Jesus Christ and the, the nature of God. We must see that the unity of the church is of great importance because it displays God's wisdom. James gives us tremendous insight in this regard. In James chapter 3, which is where you have your Bibles open to, in the first number of verses, he's talking about the danger and power and pervasiveness of the tongue. And he starts to apply very specifically particular words that come off of our tongue, beginning in verse 9. Look at what he says in James 3 and verse 9. With it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. Stop right there. Is that not what we've done this morning? We came in, and we, there was some praying and some singing. What were those songs about? You made us your own. You have bought us. You have chosen us. You have adopted us. You are the glorious Christ, greatest of all delights. We're singing praises with our tongues. So with our tongue, we praise God. This is good news. And then he says, and with it we curse people. That's bad news. These people are made in the likeness of God. So when we, when we look at someone else, that, that not nice person that jab steps out with their car, and we think, what a jerk! Now, you wouldn't say that. But maybe I might have in my head. My kids were in the car one of the times, so I didn't actually say that. But you know what you're thinking. That person, while the image of God may be marred in them, they were made in the similitude, good King James word, likeness of God. 
and we get frustrated and we say something. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. All right, so he talks to us about the tongue and what it reveals when we say something ill about someone else, believer or unbeliever. Now we look a little further and James dives in in verse 13. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, ooh, 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 me, me, I'm wise, I'm understanding. Uh, and James says, well, let's, let's test this. Let's test it. He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if, here's where you prove yourself to be a phony in saying you're wise, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth or lie about the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, everyone thinks this way, is unspiritual, this is our natural state, and what does the last one say? Demonic. James is driving at the heart of disunity, the heart of angst, the heart of conflict. The heart of conflict reveals, I'm just like everybody else, I am in my fleshly natural state, and I am influenced by demonic beings, satanic beings. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. That comes from satanic influence. God wants his church to be unified. Guess what Satan wants for the church? Disharmony, division, conflict. Look at chapter 4 of James in verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? That's interesting, isn't it? Why do you fight? Because something is going on inside of you. Well, you want to think, well, there's something going on inside of that guy or that girl. That's why the, where the real problem is. No, the real problem is there's, there's, there's a tension within you. The, the tension to say, I, it, my, my responsibility as a, a Christian, as one who knows Jesus Christ, is to humble myself and to care more about them than myself. That, that's, that's there for a believer. The other tension that's within you is, that's not fair. Don't talk to me like that. Don't treat me like that. Don't look at me like that. Don't take that jab step with, step with your car with me like that. That's not right. So there's this tension that goes on inside of you. It's war. It's fleshly, and it's satanic. Take a look, please, at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for a moment. Contention comes from inside of us, and it comes from satanic influence. Why does Satan try to attack the church and individual believers in this area of harmony, unity, love? What's the reason? Well, I want to tell you, I'm just going to, I'm going to lead with the headline. The reason that Satan wants to attack Christians at this area of love, harmony, and peace is because it detracts from the glory of God. Remember, when we're at harmony and loving, harmony and loving one another, people will know that we're His disciples. And when we're functioning together in unity, angelic realms look on and they see the manifold wisdom of God. When Satan disrupts that, what is he doing? He's... he's interrupting the glory of God, which is his primary focus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, we have this familiar passage. It says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so it's the the gospel of the glory of God as well. Because when Christ is glorified, the Father is glorified. And when Satan can 
blind the minds of unbelievers so that they don't respond to the light of the gospel, God's glory is jaded in, in his view. Now, God is always glorious, and his glory is never really on, it's not, never really up for debate, but its display may be different from one spot to another. Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So you have some tension here, and I don't want to dive too deeply into it, but I, I can't leave the, the passage leaving God on the outside saying, boy, I just wish they believed me, because that's not what God does. Um, in verse 4, he talks about Satan's attempts to, to distort the glory of God by, by blinding people's minds from the gospel. And in verse 6, he says, but don't worry, he's shown the light in your heart. He's not, God's not impotent. Do you get that? God gets the job done all the time. And so while Satan's trying to do that, and sometimes we can aid him in that endeavor. Ultimately, God accomplishes bringing glory to himself in his son, Jesus Christ, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because unity is of importance to God's church, Satan will use any means necessary to disrupt that unity. Head back to Galatians now, Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians, Paul also addresses this topic as he continues to discuss the results of the freedom that Jesus won for us. So Satan is trying to upset things. Now, Satan is not mentioned in this text. That's why we went outside of this text, because we want to see what's really at the heart of it. We, we talked about freedom in Christ last week, freedom from sin and guilt and condemnation, freedom from this inner turmoil to try to please God by obeying commandments. To, to, to be, to, oh, can, will God accept me if I just do one more thing? Jesus has set us free from that mentality. He set us free to enjoy Him. He set us free to celebrate Him. He set us free to love one another. So we talked about this freedom, and we were told to stand in that freedom, now as we look at verses 7 through 15, we'll look at a couple of concepts related to it, the first of which is this. Freedom in Christ is opposed. Freedom in Christ is opposed. Now we just talked about what the source, the ultimate source of that is Satan. Another element of that is our internal flesh that wars against truth. And the other is a world system in which we we live in. So we, we already established that. Now we can work, walk through this text pretty quickly, verses 7 through 12, that portion anyway. In verse 7, he says, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's not afraid to say it as it is. Is that clear in 7 through 12? Paul's not a wimp, and he's not afraid to tell people the truth, even if that truth doesn't quite sit right with them. Now, we don't, I don't think we ought to do that callously. I don't think that we ought to be cavalier in that. I don't think we should be um, proud of ourselves and, and come across as arrogant. I think we, in love, communicate truth with confidence and joy, and authority. In verse 7, what we want to notice is this. Any message that exalts anything other than God's redemption through Jesus Christ results in disobedience to the truth. 
when, when, when Paul had his ministry in Galatia initially, they embraced him with open arms. You'll remember they even would have been willing to give him his own, his, 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 their own eye. He, he had become so, such an important portion to him. What happened to you? How, come, how can you stop doing that? Well, the problem is they were influenced by some contrary doctrine. And any time we rely upon any doctrine more than the gospel, we are at great peril with the possibility of deviating from the gospel. He says, you were running well. Who stopped you from obeying the truth? What does it mean to obey the truth? Well, the gospel is a call. The gospel is a command. Come to me through Jesus. I've done everything for you. I have provided for your eternal redemption. I have, I have laid down my son's life so he would take your sin away. I've, I've provided for you righteousness that will, will make you in perfect standing forever. You'll, you'll have perfect standing in my presence forever. This is a, uh, uh, something that God has done for people. The call is, come to me. Believe Christ. There's no other way, no other truth, no other life. There's no other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. To find some other way to, to be right with God is to disobey the truth. And the, the people that are at odds with the gospel and with Paul are pro proclaiming a message that is contrary to the gospel. And so it is at enmity with God himself. This is the scene in Galatia. Verse 8, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. <laughs> in other words, what you're hearing is not from God. That's pretty, pretty basic. The type of message that denies the gospel or shifts the gospel or minimizes the gospel is not from God. The one who called you calls you in grace through Christ and no other way. So it doesn't come from him. This type of message, nextly, permeates the church like leaven permeates bread. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, once you deviate from the gospel and make something else, eschatology, for those of you that don't know what that means, the doctrine of last things. Oh, this I've got to know. I've got to hear about when Jesus will return. Will we return here or here or here? And, and what will take place? Uh, tell me about all these, these signs. Uh, this is like, it becomes a fascination. They've got to know all the details about all these things that God has, has given. And they're pretty, there's a lot of cryptic things going on in, in prophetic passages, but I, I have to uh, extrapolate it all and understand it all and lay it all out. And this has become what I spend most of my time meditating on, studying, and communicating. You know, you were talking about Bible stuff, but where's the focus? Where's the focus? I like to talk about the future. I, I like to know about the future. But if, if, if I don't talk about the, the Christ, <laughs> the God of all of this, the King of all of this, I'm missing the point. And when we deviate, now that was, that was using a good topic, okay, a good topic to talk about this problem. Now talk about something that is contrary to the gospel. Someone that thinks, well, in order to please God, you have to not only accept Christ, but also follow this law. Act this way. Talk this way. And God will accept you and bless you. Well, Brian already mentioned, we've received all of the spiritual blessings. Where? In the heavenly places. How? In Christ. There's not one thing. Not one element of God's blessing that he's withholded, that he's withheld from his children. Because the blessing comes not because of us in our goodness, but because of his goodness through Christ. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You think, think about it this way. Like, you wouldn't do this. Like, you, you wouldn't see someone behind um, a counter at your favorite local 
food establishment and you see them, they don't have gloves on and they have sores all over their hands and they're, they're, they're pussy, pussy sores on their hands. I'm hoping to keep you from thinking about lunch right now. They've got pussy so sores all over their hands and no gloves and they're making your sandwich. Oh, you, you want some more meat on that? All right. After this sandwich is made, first of all, you're going to say, I'm not, I'm not paying for that, right? I'm not paying for that. Or I'm definitely, like maybe you're one of those humble sorts and you don't really like to ruffle people's feathers. And you're like, oh my goodness, I, that's disgusting. I'm just, I don't think I'm, I'm, I almost, and you pay for it and you're like, go out and you throw it in the trash because you're like, I'm not eating someone's pussy sore stuff. It's not happening. Well, I know that's disgusting. Sorry if I turned your stomach, but what's worse, a nasty sandwich or something that leads you away from Christ? And Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You would never consider eating it if you knew that that nastiness was in it. You wouldn't. And here Paul is trying to protect people from false doctrine. The freedom in Christ is opposed, and he's telling us, okay, well, this message, it, it's coming, and it's, it, it's leading people toward disobedience in Christ. This message is coming, and it, it doesn't come from God. And this message is, is coming, and it, it's, it's disgusting. It's, it's not worth, you would never eat this thing. And then he starts to turn the page a little bit on it in verse 10. He says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. I love, I love this about Paul. I love this about truth. I love this about God's omniscience. He knew that the, the people of Galatia, the vast majority of the church, hadn't subscribed wholeheartedly to this variant doctrine. They were being influenced by it. They hadn't sunk their teeth into it. And so he says, I know you've been influenced. I know that this is going in this direction, and it's bad news However, I have confidence in the Lord, the one who didn't bring this persuasion to you. I have confidence in the Lord that you will not hold this view, that you'll take a different view, that, that God will essentially rescue you from this. This type of message will ultimately will not succeed. Genuine believers will not thrive under a message of works righteousness. Then he says at the end of verse 10, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So I have confidence, not only that God will not allow you to take this view, I also have confidence that God will bring judgment upon him. Now, he already talked about this kind of judgment back in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Remember, he says, if anyone preaches any other gospel than the one I preach to you, what, what do you say? Let him be accursed. That is forever damned. He's not messing around. James agrees with this. In James chapter 3 and verse 1, he said that let not many of you be teachers, knowing this, that the teacher will be worthy of greater condemnation. Lead people away from Christ. That is your worst news. Worst news. As we further work our way through this in verse 11, Paul is letting us know that proponents of false gospels make faulty accusations against gospel preachers. It's a little strange what he says in verse 11. He says this, But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? When you first read that, you think, so is Paul preaching circumcision? He's not. What he's saying is, the people that are accusing him, that are, that are teaching this other doctrine, are saying, well, Paul also preaches circumcision. And what Paul is saying, if I still preach circumcision, what I'm saying is, like, this doesn't make any sense. In that case, if that were the case, the offense of the cross is, is gone. It's been removed. So what he's saying is their, their, their statement that we preach circumcision is, is faulty. It's not correct. Here's what he really wants pretty brutal. Verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Paul is not giving well wishes to the opponents of the gospel. I figured that would be nice and sterile there. Not giving well wishes. Um, to say it a little bit more um, forcefully, he essentially says, why stop at the foreskin? 
let's, let's get it really, let's get really down to brass tacks and make it so you can't bear children any longer. Now that sounds kind of cruel. I one time had a conversation, forgive me if this is offensive to you, I don't mean to be offensive. I had a conversation with a lovely person, lovely, so don't. Um, the person was still going to a, a, another religious service. Um, and the religious service was teaching a false gospel. And she said, I really, I, it's so nostalgic, I love it. I love, they call the little children up and they, and they, and they talk to them and they're teaching them and, and it, just, it feels so good. I love being a part of this. And I, and I looked at her and I said, well, I, I understand what you're saying. I can understand the sentiment. But if you don't believe that the doctrine that's being taught to those children will lead them to heaven but to hell, how could you have any sentimentally good feelings toward that? So we ask this question of Paul now. Let's turn the table and say, okay, Paul, why, why would you say something so harsh? Why would you say, I just wish that they would really get to the point and make it so they can't bear children? Because the children that would be born of them the people that they're influencing with their doctrine would be in the grip of Satan, in the grip of false teaching, and headed toward eternal condemnation. Do we, do we still have questions as to why he's so forceful? I don't. I don't. Listen, I, don't, I, I like peace, and I like joy, and I like to get along with people, and I, like to, I, I would much prefer to find common ground with people and enjoy that common ground. That is my nature. I, I, I like peace. But not at the expense of someone's eternal soul. Not the, at the expense of the gospel. Not at the expense of the, of the Bible. Not at the expense of God's word. God speaks and you say, yes, Lord, you're right. And so Paul is harsh for a reason. The apostle John felt the same way about false teachers in 2 John 7, he calls them antichrists. In 2 John chapter, uh, chapter 1, the only chapter in 2 John, verse 10, he says, Don't receive them into your house and don't give them any greeting. Why so serious? No gospel, no rescue from sin, no rescue from sin, no salvation, and all of that equals condemnation. So there's a reason that he is so forceful. And now this comes right in the middle of chapter 5. It's almost an aside, because that's not the topic of Galatians chapter 5. He starts off by talking about our freedom, the freedom that comes from Christ. Don't be tangled again in a yoke of bondage. Don't go backwards. He says, you've been set free, and he tells us, we want not circumcision or uncircumcision to be of anything, but faith working through love. And then he tells us the reason that we're even having this conversation is this group of people that have come in and they've opposed the gospel that has set you free. And now he picks up in verse 13 through 15, and we can do this briefly. He, he picks up verses 13 through 15, the same concept from verse 6, which is faith working through love. Stand firm in freedom. What freedom? The freedom that comes from Christ. That freedom was purchased by Christ and obtained or granted to you through faith. And that faith has a working operation. It does something. It's not like, oh yeah, I learned this in whatever class and now I understand it all and so I'm good. No, when faith comes, it starts the process of revolutionizing us from the inside out. He's changing us. And he says in verse 13 and following, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. As I look at the clock on the back wall, I decide it is probably not wise to dive into this right now, but to save it for next week, lest we hurry or you be here too long. This is so against my everything within my being that screams out to just make you sit there. 
but I like you too much. But I don't want to conclude as we have at this moment. So give me a moment to just reset. The book of Galatians is all about telling us what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and how that is, ex is experienced through faith. And how in the process of that faith coming, there's activity that takes place. That's what we'll talk about next week and actually the next few weeks as we, as we finish off chapter 5. It's all about freedom in Christ being productive and, and producing something in us. One of, of those items is unity that we started our discussion with. So I want to wrap it up with that discussion of unity. God has called together, and I hope, this, I hope you are all right with this, a bunch of misfits. Like, think about yourself. Like, you know your strengths. You have strengths. I know you do. Maybe you're really intelligent, or maybe you're really industrious. Maybe you're really resourceful. Maybe you have great common sense. Maybe you have um, lots of physical ability. Maybe you're really compassionate toward others. Like you have all kinds of strengths, but you know also like you wake up every day and look at yourself in the mirror and you know a lot of things that you really don't want anyone else to know about. So you know about those things. We have different personalities and different perspectives and we have baggage that influences the way that we go through life. And God takes all of us with our varied background, strengths and weaknesses and malfunctions and puts us together. And, and what his design is, is that in that unity of misfits, the world can look on and say, there's something unique going on there. Jesus changes people like this and people like that. And people like this. You know, there are churches that, that, like, all their church ministry is revolving around this people group. Well, we're, we're a church to this group of people. We're a church of group to this kind of people. Now, some churches end up being really Caucasian, like us. <laughs> it's not on purpose. Like, we didn't, like, say, well, we're going to go witness to the whites. That's, that's not it. Some churches that happens, but like that's not the goal. The goal is that like every variety of people, men and women, boys and girls, um, from Africa, from Asia, from Russia, from Antarctica, wherever the people come from, they can come here and, and, and worship Jesus Christ. And God takes all these different people and melt, melds them together. And people can say, wow, look at what God does with, with these kinds of people. That, that's incredible. I, I know my neighborhood, and, and there was the Italian section and the, and the Portuguese section, and those two people, they didn't like each other. It was fighting all the time, right? You, you know this kind of stuff. And God can take these types of people that have backgrounds that are different and bring them together in unity for the glory of his name, for a testimony to the world, and the angelic hosts, people, the, the angelic realm as they look and say, wow, I, I never would have thought that guy would have amounted to anything. I've been watching him for all my, all my existence, looking at them, and, and I thought they were never going to amount to anything, and look at what God did to them. Only, only God could do that. But when we don't allow that unity that comes from the Spirit to permeate, when we allow personalities and perspectives and baggage to get in the way, well, I don't like the way they look, I don't like the way they talk, I don't like the way they act, that guy's a tough guy, this guy's a weenie, this guy's a this, this yeah, all this stuff that goes on. And, and we start to have diversity that doesn't blend, what are we doing? Well, that's the point where the world doesn't see anything of value. And our testimony before the angelic hosts is, they're like every other church down the street. There's something vital to the outworking of the gospel when it comes to the way we function together. That functioning together takes time, folks. Unity doesn't come when we show up five minutes before the service and leave five minutes after the service and come once a week. You're not going to get any unity there. This is just... You're, we're glad you're here. We're, we appreciate that. But th there's no melding of community. That melding of community is what God has saved us for, for the glory of his name, both in the world 
and in the angelic realm. So think about this. The outworking of the gospel necessitates, necessitates time together. Time together. And bearing with the oddities of people. I know you guys bear with my oddities. I'm up here every week and you still come. I, my oddity is like on public display. Yours may be hidden. Um, but we come together and we, we have to spend time together so that that unity that is spoken of is there and we, we have to fight, not with one another, but fight the urge to be irritated with one another to belittle one another, to look down our noses at one another. We have to fight the urge to say, well, they do it this way, I do it this way. My way, of course, is far superior to the way they do it. Eh, well, why don't we move on from that? Why don't we move on from that and say, God, you've called us together. You've called us together. Let me appreciate people in their weaknesses and their strengths. And thus, the church gathering also produces a resounding message of the gospel. I'm going to give the gospel every time you let me stand in the pulpit, okay? I'm going to do that. That's, that's, what, that's what God has called me to do. Every time you let me in here, I'm going to give the gospel. But I'll tell you what, if we all come and all of us are seeking to give the gospel by our communing together, that gospel message is now in stereo. That's better, isn't it? It's better. It takes time, and it takes bearing with one another in love. And you know what will happen? God's glory will resound. People will see the glory of God. The angelic hosts will see the glory of God. God will be pleased. Isn't that what we want? Amen? That's what we want. That's what we need. That's why we're here. Let's pray together. Father, help us. We ask that you would help us to yield to you, to love you, and that your love would permeate us rather than the leaven of false teaching, the truthfulness of the gospel, that it would permeate us and be displayed. We want you to be glorified. and We want your name to be lifted up. Do your work, please, in us. In Jesus' name, amen.